So, we're going to get on with it seriously. In the First World War, the Great War, to end all wars, Britain had been raided by Zeppelins and later by twin-engine bombers. No shelters had been prepared against this novel barbarity and frightened Londoners had invaded the underground railway stations. In London and elsewhere, there had been mass panics and near riots. Over the whole country, 1,413 people had been killed in just over a hundred raids, and this modest total would have represented only one night's work for the Luftwaffe in the winter of 1940 to 1941. But two major raids on London in the summer of 1917 had produced an average of 121 casualties per tonne of bombs dropped. The theory of air war, as the major powers developed it in the 1920s, laid great stress on a swift and tremendous initial assault, which could only be parried by counter-bombing. Speculation also confronted the terror of poison gas, which had been used on the Western Front in the First World War and was employed by the Italians in Abyssinia in 1936. <coughs> Dad, when you were an evacuee, did you have a gas mask Probably. in a cardboard box? Should I have a hat on? Um, we'll give you a hood instead. It's, it's John Ellaby, Dad. Say hello to John Ellaby. You haven't spoken to him for years, probably. Well, he didn't normally talk to me any time. I know, but things have changed. He forgets the past. So, Dad, say hello, John. Hello. hello. <laughs> Are you feeling more camaraderie, John, now that we've got a war on? Yeah, your garden is as immaculate as ever. Well, I like the garden. Mm -hmm. Like plants. In 1937, British experts estimated that in a new war, the enemy, now presumed to be Hitler's Germany, would bomb Britain at once and continue his attack for 60 days. On the basis of misleading inadequate figures of the effects of bombing in 1917 to 1918, it was assumed that each tonne of high explosive dropped would cause 50 casualties, killed and wounded. It was further assumed that the enemy had a massive fleet of suitable bombers, all of which could be used at the same time, and all of which would aim accurately at populous areas. So, in this first terrible blow, 600,000 people would be killed and twice that number injured. That's 1.2 million injured. One Briton in 25 would become a casualty, which is more than anyone's predicting, I presume, for coronavirus. Though, you know, the lasting effects on the lungs uh, do seem troubling uh, when you look at them. And in London, the main target, the proportion, would of course be much higher than one in 25. Exaggerated reports of raids on Barcelona in 1938 provided the still more terrifying multiplier of 72 casualties per tonne. These calculations are now notorious for their inaccuracy. The actual rate experienced in Britain during the Second World War proved to be no more than 15 to 20 casualties per tonne and sustained an accurate attack of the type imagined proved impossible. But the civil servants who laid plans on the basis of these errors should not be credited with preternatural stupidity. Thinking about the unthinkable, they were right to be pessimistic. If only the same had been done with pandemic planning, but the 2016 uh, civil servant um, mock-up of the pandemic uh, environment presumed a flu for which there was a, a current vaccine, um, or whatever it's called. So, um, or some form of current treatment. I have heard that on Newsnight last night, last night being the 26th of March, today being the 27th of March, if you want to check my sources on that. Um, it was quite close to the start of the programme and um, I thought that was it very well uh, explained what had gone wrong in the planning 2016 of an epidemic. Okay. Um, Baldwin's national government issued the first circular on air raid precautions to Britain's local authorities in September 1935, inviting them to shoulder voluntarily the responsibility for protecting their people. Some boroughs went vigorously ahead, others dallied, 
and continued to dally even after compulsion was introduced in 1937. In April 1937, an air raid warden's service was created. By the middle of the following year, this had recruited some 200,000 civilians. Meanwhile, scores of thousands of police and local government employees received training in anti-gas measures. So the fears of the authorities were publicised. When the intelligent citizen thought about war, he saw in his mind's eye not the noble if heart-rending scenes of 1915, not the flower of the nation marching away to fight in a foreign land, but his own living room, smashed, his mother crushed, his children maimed, corpses in familiar streets, a sky black with bombers, the air itself poisoned with gas. In September 1938, it seemed almost certain that Britain would fight in defence of Czechoslovakia. A new social survey organisation, Mass Observation, which had recruited voluntary observers amongst people all over the country and in many walks of life, discovered that a surprising number of Britons contemplated killing their families if war broke out. I'd sooner see kids uh, dead than see them bombed like they are in some places, said one woman, thinking of Abyssinia and Spain. Neville Chamberlain, hero and villain of that Munich crisis, had been Prime Minister of Britain since May 1937. He had previously been a reforming Minister of Health in the Conservative government of 1924 to 29, and more recently as Chancellor of the Exchequer, had apparently done much to steer Britain's recent recovery from slump. Upright after the old Victorian mode, arrogant in a fashion peculiar to himself, Chamberlain was nearly 70, an old man craving peace in an age destined to war. But a meanness in him denies him any claim to the dignity of tragedy. Auden, in a famous phrase, called the 1930s the low dishonest decade. They were also the golden years of David Lowe, the cartoonist. There's a pun there, uh, the low dishonest decade. Anyhow, David Lowe, the cartoonist. Chamberlain, with his winged collar, with his rolled umbrella, with the face of a nervous eagle, was only one of nature's gifts to Lowe. After all the reassessments, all the facts then taken for granted, which have turned out to be dubious or false, Lowe can still evoke for us the political creatures of that time, as a worried, radical contemporary saw them. Mussolini's puffed-out chest, Hitler's mean mouth and satanic forelock, poor kind farmer Baldwin, the dapper boyish Eden, Franco afflicted with five o'clock shadow, and fouler still, the odious little Laval and the swollen, bemedalled Goering. In the background, Churchill, but not yet the British Bulldog, merely another grotesque aberration of history. From the horrors of the First World War, Europe drove pell-mell towards the worst horrors of the Second. The Russian Revolution, a threat to the rich, an example to the poor, hung over the internal and external politics of the nations which assembled to make peace at Versailles in 1919. Even then, it seemed wise to appease Germany for the sake of another ally against Leninism. The League of Nations, then fathered, groped towards failure from the start. Soon, Mussolini made his disenchanted Italy a prototype for barbarism. In 1931, Japan shredded the pretenses of the League, attacking China with impunity. Fifteen years of economic and political chaos in Germany culminated with Hitler's rise to power in 1933. In 1935, Mussolini assaulted Abyssinia. In 1936, Hitler's forces occupied the demilitarised Rhineland and Franco raised his revolt against the Spanish Republic. While fascism and Nazism tested their soldiers and weapons in Franco's support, Britain and France pursued the mirage of non-intervention. Chamberlain, when he became Prime Minister, accepted that the notion of collective security through the League was a walking corpse and followed what he called a general scheme of appeasement, mindful of the red demons lurking in the East. High society in London showered its favours on the German ambassador, Herr von Ribbentrop. Tory MPs blurted out their admiration for the new spirit 
We've got an ambulance here, Dad. Why is there an ambulance? Oh, and a police car, and another police car. What's the story, do you think? Oh dear. Okay. Yes, you do your exercise. Good morning, I'm Paul, and this is Morris, my dad. Hello. Uh, we, we meet up from time to time and we take our yes, that's the that's good thing about it. Yes. For four months we've decided to stay within the the gate. So we'll see how it goes. Or hey. I'll see you again. Eleven to twelve we're out. Okay, I will certainly see you. Morris. Morris. And I've forgotten yours already. And Sally. Sally, you didn't tell me. But no, 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 yes, no, I got no. it now. Oh, Sally. Know each other now, then. Okay. I'm still trying to wonder what's are you not curious as to what's going on over there with a It's trouble. There's all I know it's trouble. An ambulance and two police cars, so that's why you want to get away. Because it's trouble. I, I Whereas I'm always curious about trouble. Uh, yeah, uh, it just looks like you no, know, God moves me. Um all right. I do think the homeless people are very vulnerable in the present circumstances, particularly so. And I hope they're being looked after, and so I'm concerned and feel a responsibility probably to film it. We are, we're very fortunate. Now, Morris and your name? Paul. Paul. Thank you. Okay, Cheerio, bye bye. Can you put my hat on? I'm just going to film over there, Dad.